Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for still being here despite three intensive days of talks, discussions, workshops. I just need your attention for 45 minutes more. Uh, <laughs> we can try to make it shorter. Uh, the good thing is that this is a no code workshop, a oh, short demo, and so uh, I hope you'll stay awake. Uh, so on the schedule, it's uh, written that Wes Wilson was supposed to give the talk. I'm replacing him. He had uh, to cancel, unfortunately. And uh, I'm Alex Angui. I'm the head of bioinformatics at Tursen, which is a small company that develops a product that you're going to see for the next 45 minutes. So I won't, uh, I won't talk too much about it now. Um, the talk is about how to use Tursen to run bioconductor pipelines. And I'm just going to first start with... Uh, um a general introduction uh, five to ten minutes about like uh what is Tursen. and then it's gonna be a bit more interactive i'm gonna show you how uh how to start working with Tursen. we're gonna get familiar with the interface this is a data analytics platform and finally uh the last part of the talk will be about um the pipeline but we've work together with uh, with Wes on, um, which is a flow cytometry pipeline, uh, because we, we mainly work with flow cytometry data on Tursen, but we also support and start supporting more and more pipelines around single cell and ASIC. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So Tursen is a, is a platform that enables scientists to perform big data analytics without having to learn programming. Um, and we want to change the way data analysis is performed in life sciences by being faster, more flexible, and uh, encourage collaboration, both for technical and non-technical users around this, uh, within a single platform. And I'm going to mention first the, the, the challenges we try to, to overcome with, with this. And what do the biologists and, and scientists in general want? They want more control over the data sets, and the data sets are becoming bigger and bigger and more uh, difficult to deal with. They want to add metadata and annotate the data sets and, uh, and, and, and um, for example, annotate with sample information, patient information, and so on. They want interactivity um, um, with the data, and everyone wants standardized workflows. That is, you have your data set, you have a standard workflow that you run and you get your, your results. And uh, no one wants to use many, many tools. So <laughs> the best thing is when you can have a, a single place where you can do all your analysis. Now about us, uh, bioinformaticians, I will assume that uh, we would, uh, most of us would identify as bioinformaticians. Then there's like a, a full spectrum between the pure biologist and pure bioinformatician. Uh, what do bioinformaticians want? They, they, they want to support scientists. Uh, they also want standardized workflows and processes, have version controlled systems, and uh, be able to offer innovative algorithms to their, uh, to their teammates. And most important thing, I think uh, we would all agree, we, always want to increase efficiency of our processes. And especially uh, some of us are obsessed almost with automation. And uh, we like to automate pipelines and the deployment and reuse existing code as well. So this is our big goal. Uh, might be a bit ambitious, but what we want to do at Tursen is to empower the biologist and liberate the bioinformatician. So let's see, let's see if that works. <laughs> So now, uh, if we talk more specifically about single say data, because uh, you can see from the talks we've seen over the last three days, uh, bioconductors <laughs> used to be maybe more than single say data, but I think now that 90% of, uh, of uh, research efforts are around single say data. Uh, there are challenges associated with that, especially when you want uh, nowadays maybe to, to, to uh, bring together different data sources. They come from different sources, different readouts, uh, different workflows, sometimes like uh, different ontologies. We talked about ontologies uh, just before. And uh, sometimes you, you, you have different names for the same thing. Uh, and um, 
also some coding frameworks are preferred also for some uh, some data types and uh, it's everything uh, everything is <laughs> is a bit all over the place and sometimes it can be difficult to integrate with uh, different data sources and different frameworks so this these are the challenges associated more specifically with uh, single say data and what does Thurston take care of we try to provide an abstraction of the data so structure uh, around how the data is handled and and uh, uh, in the platform we have an abstraction around operators what we call an operator and sometimes an app is a piece of code uh, like a brick in a workflow uh, that is reusable and that would work regardless of the input data so we abstract the the, the operator and the computation tasks uh, we handle relationships between uh, computed data. I will get back to it later. That's uh, one of the core components of Thurston. And uh, there's a high performance uh, visual interaction system that could be of interest um, to explore interactively the data that works up to, to, to millions of data points. Um, and, and finally, we have uh, algorithms that are standardized as apps and standardized workflows. So, um, when I talk about algorithms, like we did not re-implement everything, right? And that's also why we're here, because uh, we benefit from uh, the open source community developments, because the, there's a statistical layer with the algorithm. These are bioconductor algorithms that could be any, uh, any programming language, could be Python, R, MATLAB, Java, anything. I have this piece of code. And Tursen is a layer or even two layers on top of these computations. There's a relational data layer. That is, we will build relations uh, between inputs and outputs. You will see that later on. And there's a visualization layer on top of everything where you can interactively uh, or play with, uh, play with your data and, uh, and visualize even large amount of data. Uh, so about apps and the operator development process. So as I mentioned, there's this, uh, there are these rich statistical ecosystems uh, built around R, Python, uh, Java, and so on. Um, there's, of course, Bioconductor and uh, all other frameworks for, for bioinformatics pipelines, uh, such as Nextflow, but there are many, many other ones. And the idea of developing an operator and having like a brick, developing a brick for, for a workflow in Tursen is what we call an appification uh, process. That, that is, we convert these algorithms uh, that are in different languages, in different frameworks, into a common language uh, within Tursen. And so we wrap these, um, these functions, these packages, we build what we call operators, we test them, we have like a, a quality process around that and uh, we release then an app and that can be used and installed in, in, in one click typically. Now, um, before um, switching to the demo, I'm just gonna mention the, the use case that I'm gonna be presenting. As I mentioned, uh, this work has been done in collaboration with Wes Winsor from the University of Pennsylvania. And um, we, uh, we developed like a, a flow cytometry pipeline on Tursen for uh, Novocyte data. So we start from FCS file, and here you have a summary of the pipeline. We'll get back to it later. Uh, that is, we have these FCS files, and uh, there are some data processing and QC steps. Here, each of these square would be an app, an operator in Tursen. Then uh, we use uh, flow sum algorithm for clustering, and then we have like a few other apps for interpretation and, and uh, insight generation once uh, this is done. And then we end up with some graphs, some metrics, some tables, or a PDF report for the scientists or anyone in, in the team. And uh, again, uh, we're talking about bioconductor pipelines here because they are. Uh, this is based, mostly this is a, a, a minimal version of this workflow, which is a bioconductor workflow but by uh, Novika and collaborators. I think uh, 
Lukas Weber here. So thank you, Lukas. <laughs> so, take this opportunity. Um, and uh, yeah, this is the main source of inspiration. And again, uh, over bioconductor pipelines are a big source of inspiration for us. Uh, and that way, once we bring a pipeline to Dursen, uh, it is version controlled, it is standardized, and uh, but it is also interactive and extensible and flexible. As I mentioned, these are bricks, so you can, if you don't like uh, Flowsome or if it does not work well on your data, you just replace uh, this block by another one and, uh, and run uh, the pipeline again. So now, uh, this is demo time. I, uh, enough slides for now. So uh, this is a relatively short demo, so uh, this is not supposed to be uh, too interactive, but you could, uh, if, if you'd like to, you could, uh, you could try to, to follow along. Uh, if, you, if you want to follow along, you can create an account and connect to, to the cloud version of Tursin.com. So if you go to Tursin.com um, and, and try it out as well, you can do that at home also. Um, so there will be four small parts. First, I will give a general intro to the Tursin user interface. Um, we'll see how to run the computation using an operator, and then I will switch to a, a bigger workflow, and I will show you a uh, flow cytometry pipeline. And finally, if we have time, uh, uh, we're going to talk a bit about operator development. I can show you the code and how it looks like for, for, uh, from the developer's perspective. All right. So uh, if I go to uh, person.com here, so I'm already uh, logged in, uh, but you can create an account if you uh, I think I don't see many laptops in the room, but <laughs> just in case uh, it, it takes uh, just one minute. Uh, and then, so we have um, the structure is around projects and teams. A project will contain some data and some workflows and maybe some, some, some reports as well. And Teams is a way to have a common workspace uh, between collaborators and, and share data and, and workflows easily. Uh, so if I just create like a small project, like a new project just to show you in, the, in, in, in my team, so in my own uh, workspace, uh, I'll call it my project just to be original. And now I have this new, uh, this new window where uh, I have an empty project basically and the first thing I want to do is to add uh, a data set uh, <laughs> that I will analyze. So uh, you could, if you want to download one, we have like the crabs data set here in, uh, on GitHub. Uh, you can go to the Tursin's GitHub, github.github.com slash Tursin. Uh, slash crabs data set if you want to download uh, a data set um, to play around with this and, and uh, we can have it in the wide format in the long format if you don't know crabs this is iris but with crabs basically it's like one of the base r uh, data sets uh, you can click on crabs long that's one way of doing it uh, row then uh, right click save us but not in french and uh, and save it on on your uh, on your computer. Uh, all right, this is just if if you're following along. Um, but I already have it on my computer, so I'll click on new data set. And you see here when we click on new data set, I have multiple options, and each of these options is an operator. It's a special kind of operators, but it's designed to import data, and could be a text file like here. It's a simple text file, but as you can see, we have an operator to import some uh, cell render output for, for, for 10x uh, data. Uh, we have for flow cytometry uh, an operator to import FCS files as well, or a zip of multiple FCS files. So this is again very flexible because this is code that we've written. Right? This is just a wrapper uh, around some existing functions. Uh, and here I'm just going to load. The text file I have downloaded, a crabs dataset, 
and I click next. You see the columns. So I have uh, different variables and different measurements for these variables. And then I have uh, metadata, let's say, uh, about these crabs. And I have an observation ID. That's uh, a very simple data set. I, I think the, the science in the beginning was to compare different species of crabs. And I upload it. And here it is. Now I want an, to analyze it. So I'll create a new workflow that I'm going to call originally my workflow. OK. And here I have a new um, page with a canvas. And this will contain my workflow. By workflow, I mean I will have different nodes, different bricks, blocks that I will connect um, um, in this interface. And I will add the data, I can add multiple data sources, I can join them, and I can run some computation tasks in there. So I can right click here and click on add, or uh, there's a button here to add a step as well. So we call these blocks steps because they're different steps in the, in the workflow. So I can add first the table here. I find the tables that have loaded in my project. Okay, and I load the data. Now I want to visualize and maybe perform a computation on this data. So I will add another step here. And it's called a data step. And this is the core view of Tosin. This is the place where you will interact with your data, where you will be able to query your data, to visualize it, and to run a computation here. This is what we call the cross-tab view. Uh, and we sometimes refer to, uh, to projections because we're going to project data onto this, uh, this canvas here. What you see on the left here is a list of factors that are contained in my data set here. Uh, let's say I see if the variable is numeric or a uh, factor here, and um, I can, for example, drag and drop the measurement. And you see that when I drag the, the, the measurement factor, I have different things that are displayed here. I can put it in different places. I can use it as a color, as a y-axis, as an x-axis, as a column, or as a row. And I put it in the x, in the y-axis, sorry. And now it's being displayed. So it, it runs a small task, a visualization task. And now it displays the data. By default, it's sorting it because it's, uh, it's an efficient way of dealing with the data. It does not matter for crabs, but it matters for bigger data sets. Uh, um, and yeah, but now I want to, to do a bit more with my data and maybe combine factors. And if I take a variable here and put it as a, as a row, for example, Row and columns will stratify my uh, projection um, and create cells, what we call cells here. Uh, and you see here that I have my observations that are stratified um, by variable, my variable column. So I can, uh, I can adjust the size. Uh, let's say now I want to, to, to look at the color. I can put it in the columns here. And I will stratify my data using uh, the color factor on my, uh, from my input data. And so it should create one cell, one column per color. Yeah, you see blue and orange, and I have stratified my data. Uh, I have graphical parameters here. I can have multiple layers. Uh, just for if you want to. to uh, to, to add other measurements and, and compare them. I have points, lines, bars, uh, and so on. We can add an x-axis and, and so on. Uh, let's say I can put a like, color here uh, as well, and it should color according to uh, the color factor again. And um, so it's not just about visualizing data here. It's also. Um, a way to query the data. So you have data, and um, this cross-tab view, this input projection, is a way to query your data and prepare it in a way that will be uh, read by the, uh, the operator that will run the computation. So 
it's going to be maybe more explicit once I, I load an operator. Now I will uh, I will do a computation on this um, on this data. Let's say I want to compute the mean per uh, cell here because I want to see like for each variable I like to to compare the mean of uh, the blue crabs and orange crabs. So I will add an operator here. I have a few installed, but I have uh, uh, an app library, which is a set of curated um, curated operators that we've developed. Uh, and if I search for the mean, I have a mean operator. I also have other ones. We support shiny apps as well. Uh, let's say I'm just gonna get the mean here. And well, I install it. See, it's being displayed here. I can have some operator settings, uh, so not for the mean, unfortunately, because it's, it's a very simple computation, but I can have settings. And if I click on run here, it starts a computation task. And what it's gonna do is that it's gonna compute the mean per cell here. Because we decided in the operator code that it's go uh, it was going to, to compute the, the mean per cell. But it could be the mean per row, the mean per column, like we decide when we develop an operator. So you could imagine that the same way you could do a PCA on your data, right? You have uh, your variables, you have all your observations, then uh, you have a PCA operator, you project it uh, data the right way, it does the PCA and it outputs a result. So this is really something you have to think about it in, as a way to prepare your data, query your data, not just visualize it and uh, run a computation, but we create an output. And now it has done the computation. And if I go to the computed tables here, I can see that these are um, a column. This is the column index, the row index here, but the most important one is the mean that we've computed per, uh, per cell here. What gets interesting is that you see I have, uh, go back to my workflow, can rename it, uh, compute, compute min. I can add a new step after this one. So you see my, my, um, my workflow is, is being built here and we have links here. So we, we're actually making actual relations uh, between all the data we compute and by default, it displays what I just computed. So it displays the mean here. And you see that you can find like all the factors, the previous one, but also uh, the, the new one here. So we've computed the mean here. It's already here. You can display it as a, as a bar plot, for example. And I have the mean um, per cell, so per color and per variable. It made a relation to, um, to, to each cell. I mean, like, the, the mean has been computed per cell. So it knows, for example, that this is the mean for, um, for orange crabs for the variable BD. So now if I use another factor here, uh, person would know how to make the relation with um, other factors that have not been explicitly used in the computation before. So as this is one aspect of, of Tussin that makes it uh, powerful is that you can imagine you have a big workflow and uh, you cluster your, your, your cells using using flow sum and uh, and then uh, you add a sample annotation you would not have to redo flow sum and so on you just make a relation to this to this sample annotation and you can cluster and play around with your data the, the way you want uh, so this was uh, like a very brief introduction to the uh, to Tosin's user interface. I'm, I'm just gonna pause here and, and ask if, if there are any questions uh, in the room or online about Tosin in general before we move on to the flow cytometry part. Yes. This looks really cool. Um, can you build your own visualization functions that you can add in here? So if you had a, a custom visualization for a specific data type, could you add that to this workflow? Yeah, 
Um, that's, that's a good question. I think I'm ju just going to skip the uh, flow cytometry part and talk about the last part about operator development. I'm just going to show you how it looks like, uh, how the code looks like. Here we have the mean operator, which is an R operator. We have also Python, anything, Docker. Uh, if I click here, I can see the source and you see everything is version controlled. Uh, and so it's, it's convenient if you want to understand why something looks wrong. Uh, if I look at the code, there's a lot of things that are more around the continuous integration, uh, code quality, and so on. Around this to, uh, is to manage package dependencies, and you have unit tests, so a lot of heavy things to compute the mean, but it's like uh, good practices in programming. But the most important part is this is the, the part that is being run. And you see that we have a, a Tursun API. We have two packages uh, to interact with Tursun. And basically, what is being run every time is that we run this, we get a Tursun context, and this Tursun context allows us to interact with the uh, input projection. Then we use the uh, like a tidyverse uh, syntax here. Uh, from this context, we select the y-axis, the column index, and the row index, and then we do things uh, here for performance, but we do a group by and a mean per cell. So this like this is transparent, right? It's not like uh, we have a now we have a block, we can modify it, we can we can uh, do anything. So anyone basically could create an operator. We have some templates and this maybe and uh, we have uh, um, I will show it later. We have uh, the app builders guide to uh, to explain how to how to build your own apps, but you can you can build anything basically. So you can compute a, a more complex algorithm. You can output an image, like a upload a PNG file. You can output a PDF, uh, a table, multiple tables with different relations with input data. Uh, so it's it's extremely flexible. That's one of the strengths of of this, and maybe. The learning curve is might be steep, maybe for uh, for developers, but it's uh, it's extremely powerful. It's, I mean, it's not that steep, right? You see, it's like a few lines of code to compute the mean. But yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, then uh, let's see the, the cool stuff now. Uh, so I didn't want to. Uh, to start with this workflow, because uh, yeah, I just wanted you to to get familiar with the interface, right? Uh, this is a uh, flow cytometry workflow, uh, the site of workflow. You can find it uh, if you go to to person.com/explore. You can find some public projects and with examples like. If you're familiar with flow cyto algorithms, we have tracksum, force, you know, recent uh, recent methods that have been developed. So we have public examples, uh, and there's a, a BioC 2022 Tosin demo project here that you can you can browse. Uh, we have like a few a few a few useful links here, the reference of the data set and the the, the site of workflow, and uh, the workflow itself is here, the end-to-end -end site of workflow, uh, and what we load here is from public data set from uh, Bob and Miller and collaborators. It's like a set of FCS files that, have, that are uploaded as, as, a, as a zip. Uh, so just so we're on, on the same page, flow cytometry, like you're measuring the, the intensity of, of different markers um, and, and, uh, in cells. So you have like basically a big matrix of, like, I don't know, 10, 20 markers with, uh, with millions of observations, and each observation is uh, a cell. And what we want to do is to cluster these cells and uh, maybe annotate them, knowing like which cell type it is, and uh, and counting them and looking at the proportion and seeing if they are differentially abundant between between conditions. That's the, the typical workflow uh, in flow cytometry. And so you see that uh, we start with the data, and then we have a gather step to go from a wide format to a long format. This is just more convenient uh, in Tosin. Uh, then there are simple steps like ACNH. This is a common data transformation uh, in, um, in in flow cytometry. 
Uh, so here again, we project the data. Uh, we have uh, our variables, these are, which are the channels here. We have the observations here uh, as, as columns and, and the values here, and we just compute the, the SNH of, of these values. This is a common transformation. Then we have a step to run Flossum, it is, uh, which is a, um, a popular clustering algorithm in, a, in the field. And uh, what Flossum outputs is, an, an, I think it outputs some cluster IDs, you see. So we have cluster IDs, meta cluster IDs, um, and, and so on. And um, I mentioned that we could also display some graphs. So if I look at the Flossum MST operator, and when I go to the computed table here, I uh, actually outputted not another table, but a graph. So you could, uh, you could display some relevant plots here um, if the Tussin interface is not enough. Uh, so you can do bar plots or anything, right? Some ggplot code uh, um, that works with the, the input production that you defined, and, uh, and, and that's it. Uh, and, and, and yeah, then the next steps are um, more around interpreting the results. So we have a, an enrichment score. Um, uh, we order the clusters and by enrichment score, I mean that you can um, see for each cluster that you've estimated in, uh, in uh, using Flossum, which marker, um, which markers tend to have a higher or lower than expected value. And here you see, for example, that uh, we have between this, we have two groups of clusters basically that uh, are separated by uh, uh, the values of these markers. So, which means, that, for example, BC7 tend to have high values in, uh, in these clusters and low values in, in the other clusters. So, this helps interpretability. And um, then you can uh, you can annotate uh, your population also as well. So, these are operators that we've developed, right? But you could do uh, you could do anything basically uh, as long as you uh, have someone who, who can code. Uh, and yeah, maybe just to, to to show you a bit more about the interactivity and 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 why it matters to to create these relationships between data. Here, when we run the the UMAP, which is a, a dimension reduction method, uh, when we run the UMAP and we want to see the the results, I can add a data step here. Uh, let's say I'm going to remove everything here. You see a UMAP, I have access to everything that has been computed before. You see that UMAP outputs two things, UMAP1 and UMAP2, which are the two first dimensions of the UMAP. Uh, so I can see the UMAP here. It looks a bit funky. Uh, but yeah, now I can, I don't know, I can color with... Uh, um, Let's say I want to see how CD3, the CD3 values on my on my UMAP. This is something that was not used for the UMAP uh, computation itself, right? But the relations are here and are, are implicit and are created implicitly. So when I computed the UMAP, I created a relation with each observation. The coordinates of the UMAP are associated to observations. And these observations are associated to marker values, so I can reuse them and explore them interactively. So as a, as a immunologist, I mean, I, I'd love to do that, right? Because for me, it's CD something and so on. <laughs> they don't mean a lot, right? But I know that uh, like if, if I show that to immune, immunologist, they would directly look for, for uh, a relevant marker and have a look, oh, this, uh, this group, this cluster. Is uh, is this cell type instantly? This is this is magic. But <laughs> uh, and I can even do a bit more. For example, look if I if I put the channel variable here uh, as a row, I will stratify my UMAP result um, per marker. And if I put this time the value of the marker as a color, I will have um, a very relevant visualization for. Um, for immunologists. And here, it takes a few seconds, and we, we're talking about millions of data points, right, uh, that are being displayed and, and handled. So uh, 
we're quite happy with the performance of the visualization uh, layer. And you see here uh, that, that fly, yeah, that's the same one as, <laughs> as earlier. Uh, we see, uh, for example, like BC1, uh, is like this, there are strong differences, like uh, these clusters uh, on the right uh, have a higher expression of BC1 and uh, the clusters on the left and so on. And so you can, you can really interact with your res results and, and do more than, uh, than just run the, the pipeline and then you get an output table and output report. But it's, it's more than that, you can do a bit more. Um, yeah, maybe uh, last thing with, with this workflow I mentioned, uh, you, can, uh, you can display data differently, you can, you can do plots, you have bar plot operator. If, if you're not satisfied with uh, the looks of the Tosin interface, you can, uh, you can do ggplot. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe before uh, moving to the last part, um, are there any questions around the flow cytometry workflow? Yes. Um, yeah, so I see that you have this all in one giant workflow. Is it also possible to kind of split this up and then have workflows that are connected to each other? Like maybe the output of one workflow feeds into the input of the next one? Yeah, that's a very good cool. question because that was the next part. <laughs> uh, so just like I can export like here, I can add, I have different ways of uh, uh, different types of steps. I can add uh, there's an export uh, functionality here that will create um, a CSV file in my project that I can reuse in another workflow. But the other thing I wanted to show you, uh, so here this is actually not um, OS's data that I've used because this is uh, the workflow that is uh, gonna be shared with, with, with all of you. But if I go to the uh, workflow we've actually done with, uh, with Wes Wilson, and if I go to the workflow, you see that I can also have some sub workflows here. If I open it, this is my data preprocessing workflow with an input and output. I do some automated gating here. I add some views, uh, do some QC steps here with flow cut. Uh, and here, if I double click, I can decide to, to display like only a few relevant uh, visualization. Like for example, singlet gating here. Let's hope this one looks good. Yeah, uh, and I can have, uh, I can see the, the results of my automated gating. So there's a way to create sub workflows like this. There's a way to create independent workflows and, 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 and uh, exporting the results. Uh, and also to share and reuse workflows, you can also uh, create templates. Um, and for example, a template is uh, if I create a workflow, uh, I have here some existing templates that are version controlled workflows, basically. Uh, and this one is, is designed to work with, uh, with uh, we have a Flojo plugin, uh, if that's of interest to some of you. And I can load a, a, a workflow that I have uh, templatized. And you can see here that I have my workflow. Uh, we've done sampling, flow sum, enrichment score, TSNI, UMAP, and so on. I just need to plug in new data. That's one way of sharing uh, workflows as well. Any, any other questions? Yep. Is, is it possible to export out um, the code? Ah, like, yeah, having like a, a script of, uh, <laughs> so uh, not at the moment, uh, not really. So each, uh, each step is, is transparent, so you can easily go and, 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 and check the code. So I can imagine that it would be like uh, an easy feature to, to implement, uh, but it's not implemented yet. Sorry, this thing takes a minute to warm up. Uh, I just wondered about it because um, you could build a, a really quite complicated flow and it would be very convenient to sort of structure it using the GUI, but the downfall of GUIs is it's very hard to reproduce what you did sometimes. Um, 
without being in that exact GUI again. And as time moves on and software changes, you can lose track of the work that you did in the past. But if you could export a script, a record of what you had done, then you have something more tangible that's more probably more durable over time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that would make sense. So uh, how I could imagine it would be like to 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 take a snapshot of of a workflow at a given time uh, because maybe after you interact with it and you update uh, Flowsum to the latest version and then that's that's different. So for some reason, so yeah, it would be a, a useful. Can I step in on that question? Sure, we we can hear you. Sweet. Uh, so the other Alex, um, actually, I had that same issue where I needed the re reproducibility in academia. And the other Alex has actually built me a feature which will allow me to export uh, my code directly from the run. So if you have a result at the end, you can export now every bit that was run forward. So you mean, sorry, I didn't hear very well. Uh, he's done it? Yeah, the other Alex has implemented a feature okay. now that allows me to export the code from uh, a run. Okay. Okay, so I guess Wes is with us. Uh, so hi, Wes. Uh, over the, yeah, <laughs> very strongly with it. Uh, yeah, the other Alex is our, our CTO, Alexandre Morel. Uh, he's, uh, he's doing, oh, he's built most of the product actually. It doesn't. Uh, so yeah, it's it's on the way uh, to be shipped then. All right. Um, yeah, uh, three minutes left, I think, because uh, it's. 2 12 uh, my time <laughs> um first time i give a talk that late um yeah i think i'm just gonna uh wrap everything up uh i'm just checking if, if there's uh another thing that i wanted to, to to show you uh yeah then i mean yeah you can do more uh statistical stuff with uh with actual p-values and, <laughs> and so on yeah, we have, we have, we, yeah, we have uh, Wilcoxon operators and over. If, if some are, are missing, we're happy to develop more. We're happy to train people to, to develop more. But yeah, as long as it can be written in, in code, we can, uh, can wrap something. So how the immunologists go here and gate by themselves? Like for a bioinformatics perspective, it is very easy to follow. And, you know, this pipeline is very, very cool. But to yeah. make them, make biologists or immunologists like yeah. follow this path, like operating. But that, that, that makes sense. And, and these, these workflows are intimidating, uh, but we can, we can hide them into like uh, sub workflows like this, and 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 just surface the relevant metrics like this, and and then train the immunologist to okay, look at the, the gating here. Uh, does it does it look good to you or not? Is it too stringent? If not, you can you can tweak this parameter. So that's that's one way of of, of doing it. We can hide some of these things and and templateize them. That is, they have a, a given input data set. And we have a template that runs that runs everything. Um, or uh, we have also the concept. I didn't have time to show it of apps, which is another layer on top of that. This is so workflow, but that is getting smarter. That will ask the user with a, a better interface and not having to project uh, the data. What is your measurement? What is your your channel uh, factor? Uh, what is the, your grouping factor? What is your treatment viable? And then uh, Dustin is smart enough to, to pick up uh, and, and make the production uh, itself. So this is one way we, we can bring workflows to, 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 uh, to non-technical users. Yeah. Again, depends on the team a lot. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, maybe I can just uh, finish it, like it's 2.15. Um, all right, I'm just gonna uh, with the slides and then I'll be around a bit if, if you want to, 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 to continue discussing or if you want to hear more. Uh, so if I go back to the slideshow. Um, so yeah, operator development, uh, we have something called Tosin Studio, which is basically 
including uh, a local version, a version of Dustin that you can run locally and uh, with an R Studio server also uh, that you can run locally and interact with the API. So you have R Studio, you have your local Dustin, and you develop interactively. So you you, you load the data from uh, your local Dustin and you develop your operator and then you push it to GitHub and uh, and you can install it on Dustin. So, um, yeah. In terms of deployment, I won't enter the detail. Just if some of you are interested, we we use Docker and, and Kubernetes. So it's it's again very flexible, and these are common frameworks. So uh, it scales. It can be installed in your organization if you don't want to use the cloud uh, to to upload your data. It can be uh, run locally as well, um, and we can connect to external storage. So you don't have necessity to upload data. We can also connect to to uh, an S3 bucket or, or anything. Uh, so, and final slide, uh, what we're trying to do with, with this and is to, to hit the sweet spot where everyone's happy and we bring harmony to the lab. Uh, data scientists can uh, develop reusable apps and, and prototype and, and deploy uh, so, so, some new algorithms and uh, with a, a flexible platform, the scientists or, or biologists with a standardized workflow that are more or less easy to use, depending on how far you want to go in, in, uh, in the customization. Uh, everything, if possible, into a single platform uh, and also uh, the ability to interact with the data. So, so a good thing to for multi-omics, everyone's talking about it, but I'm not sure <laughs> who is actually doing it. And we had like a good example with a keynote this, uh, uh, this morning of, uh, of multi-omics with <laughs> good results and like a, it's beautiful you map clustered with uh, with a genotype. I think I will, yeah, I dream of seeing that on, <laughs> on Tosin. Uh, but this would be a good platform because you can join annotation, join new data sets, and, uh, and easily interact with them again. And uh, we try also to make IT happy uh, by being uh, easy to integrate into existing systems and so on. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, uh, our collaborators from uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, Michael Meloni, Wes uh, is on the call, and people at, at Tursen, Martin Mito, Lucas, Alexandre, Maho, and, and Faris, and uh, of course, bioconductor organizers and bioconductor contributors, because you can see we rely heavily on, on, on open, open source software. And uh, and yeah, if you want to hear more about Tursen, you can contact us. You have the, the, all the information here. If you create an account, you can book a free session with us, so we can discuss how you could uh, you could benefit from it, or we can learn from from your workflows. And uh, we'd be happy to discuss anytime with you. So thank you all, and happy to take any more questions. Wes actually had a quick comment to add about uh, critical stakeholders. Yeah, yeah, so hopefully I'm not too loud in the room. I'll try to use indoor voice. Um, so basically, one of the things I'm using Tursen with that's been really effective is sort of using with stakeholders that are clinicians, um, sometimes wet lab scientists, PhD students, postdocs, who who don't have that experience. So they can, you know, anybody can learn Bioconductor. We've all done it. We've all started somewhere. But as you guys know, with data, if you do something kind of wrong at the beginning, pre-processing, cleaning the data, what is real, what is not, hearing noise, then your downstream analysis can kind of be jacked up, right? So what this allows Tursen allowed me to do is, is take my existing pipelines that are all bioconductor packages. A lot of them were Docker and Nextflow, but Tursen supports Docker and Nextflow. So you don't have to like, you know, you can take your existing pipelines. And it allows two things to happen really, really well. One, I'm no longer, CC'd in as a data custodian. So if a postdoc gets data off the NovaSeq or a clinical trial is doing a bunch of flow data, I don't have to worry about their data anymore because now they can upload their data and they can start a pipeline I've already built that we already trust the pre-processing of. And then I can go in after those pre-processing steps have done, the alignment's been done, you know, the count matrix has been generated from the from the fast queues. After all that's been done, I can go in and tweak and look at things. But what's great is all those mid-layer graphs along the way. Because now, you know, I'm not getting an email every other morning being like, hey, Wes, can you like graph this gene compared to this gene? Hey, oh, I gave you a new idea. I want to look at this gene now to this gene. And you're not just 
you know, you're a bioinformatician. You want to do statistical analysis. You want to do cool algorithms. You want to find cool stuff. You don't want to be making graphs every day for somebody, right? And this allows the stakeholders to get in there and they can play with the little things and look at the things that are not bugging you for like another, another version, um, you know, putting extra, extra cofactors on the heat map. Um, and so that has really allowed me to like help a lot more people with their data without taking on tons and tons of extra sort of housekeeping work. Um, and so as a bioinformatician, uh, so I'm a, a bioinformatician at UPenn, for those who don't know, part of CCI, a Center for Cellular Immunotherapy. So all we do is clinical trials. And it's just, you know, there's lots of different people doing lots of different things. Uh, and I kind of have to help them all. So um, it's been really, really helpful for that. So if you're in a bioinformatics core, that's where you work, that might be a different environment. Maybe you don't need that. But if you are someone who's supplementing a bunch of non-bioinformaticians, it's so useful. Cool. Thanks for the nice comment. Any other question before we close it? No. All right. Then uh, we're all ready for for the closing ceremony. Thank you all.